Uh, great to see you all again. Uh, the to topic uh, of today's workshop is team and uh, competencies. And uh, we have here Alexander Gansen from Estonia. So I will uh, give the floor to Alexander. <clears throat> well, thank you, Katrin, and uh, greetings uh, uh, from Estonia, everyone. Uh, as we have agreed with uh, uh, Katrin and uh, uh, with Dana, uh, there won't be any uh, bullshit today. So we're going to only uh, discuss my uh, personal experiences because uh, I expect that uh, every one of you uh, are able to Google or to use ChatGPT to uh, get some uh, generic results on those questions, but uh, uh, I would dive deeper into my previous experiences. And uh, the subjects uh, we're going to discuss with you uh, today, um, basically each of those subjects uh, can be uh, discussed during the full day seminar and still will not be covered. Uh, they are very wide and uh, very deep. Uh, so it's quite a tough assignment for me to uh, go through them within the next uh, 70 minutes, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, just uh, shortly about uh, myself. Today, uh, I'm here as a lead mentor of uh, Technopol Startup Incubator, but uh, I'm a founder myself. Uh, I founded my first uh, startup in uh, 2014. Uh, that was a, a supply chain uh, uh, tech company. I exited it in 2019 and uh, left uh, the company in early 2021. After that, we uh, went into the Web3 uh, fantastic field uh, and started to work on a blockchain for supply chain. Today, we are running uh, the largest uh, Web3 uh, conference in uh, uh, Nordic and Baltics, uh, focusing on uh, blockchain uh, technology, uh, gaming, metaverse, uh, all those fancy stuff, uh, which is uh, far in the future. And uh, as a mentor, I also invest in uh, some of uh, um, our technical portfolio tech teams, uh, either as an early stage angel or uh, as a sweat equity. Uh, I work with uh, several companies hands-on, helping them with uh, team building, uh, uh, strategic sales and uh, business development. So that's about me. Now let's uh, jump into uh, the subject of our uh, today meeting and uh, uh, let's talk about teams first. Uh, I guess, uh, Many of you or most of you uh, have heard uh, the uh, combination of a uh, 3H when we are talking about uh, the minimum viable team. And uh, it's a theory that says that when we have a hustler, a hacker and a hipster, that's the uh, perfect combination of competences uh, uh, to start a company. Uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, every time we evaluate uh, uh, companies in our uh, incubator panel, we are looking into uh, this combination, trying to understand, do they have all the necessary competences on board? Because usually when uh, the company starts, it's either uh, the techie or person who comes up with an idea uh, of uh, a certain service or a product. And uh, uh, in most cases, uh, those people are uh, not really good at uh, sales. I can't say that not at all, but uh, uh, okay. Uh, the three H is hustler, hacker, and uh, hipster. And so uh, in many cases, the techie people are not able to sell their product, promote their product. So we insist on finding uh, someone uh, hustling and uh, taking the product uh, uh, to the users, to the testers. And obviously, uh, in order uh, for this product to be 
well sellable it should be uh, packaged and uh, this is where hipster comes in uh, so if you are analyzing uh, your current team always uh, think about uh, are those uh, three competences uh, covered uh, from the very beginning because uh, if not uh, then investors will definitely look uh, differently at you uh, then the question is where to find uh, missing uh, competences well uh, there are many ways for that obviously uh, a lot of pitching uh, it will take a lot of pitching and a lot of meetings at different uh, meetups at uh, different conferences and uh, uh, industry events uh, but uh, if uh, the idea is uh, strong enough you will definitely find the backers and it doesn't mean that those people has to come on board uh, full-time they can be also part-time i'll give you uh, an example from my first uh, startup uh, when we started uh, we had uh, two hustlers uh, we had uh, uh, one hipster uh, but uh, we didn't have a hacker and uh, that was uh, quite an issue because uh, even when we got into the Startup Wise Guys acceleration program, we still didn't have the coder, uh, a person who would uh, start writing the platform. Uh, it took us uh, almost uh, three months to identify and uh, find the first person. Eventually, uh, he wasn't the right one, uh, so it took us another uh, two to three months uh, uh, to find a coder who actually uh, could lead the uh, development. Uh, how uh, we solved uh, this issue in uh, some of our, my later projects is uh, we were talking with uh, developing development teams and uh, development houses, uh, sharing some equity uh, with them as a sweat equity and uh, basically outsourcing uh, all of our coding uh, uh, to those teams because uh, they have a competence, they have frameworks, uh, and uh, uh, they can give you quite uh, a strong uh, guarantee on uh, both uh, quality and uh, timing. Uh, and uh, if necessary, they can force uh, the product, the MVP, to the market. So certainly if you have a coder in-house, it's always better. But uh, if not, it doesn't mean you cannot launch your product. Definitely can. Now, uh, another, uh, so to say, mistake that uh, I have made in... Uh -huh, there's a question. Okay, uh, so uh, the hustler is basically the one who is pitching, selling, uh, going to the meetings, uh, talking to investors uh, and finding uh, uh, the next employees. And uh, the hipster, uh, as we call them, are uh, the type of people who are designers with design thinking and are able uh, to design both uh, product and, uh, and front end um, or uh, the service. So yeah. And so uh, the problem we had in our team uh, at this particular moment was that uh, uh, several uh, skills and several personalities uh, were uh, covered, but they were double covered. And uh, uh, me, uh, as a CEO and a friend of mine, well, as my uh, COO, uh, we basically uh, were filling the same gap in the company. And that was a problem because uh, ego is uh, the enemy. There's an amazing book with the same name. And uh, uh, usually in the first uh, startup, uh, uh, it's very common that uh, everyone wants to lead. So it took us uh, another three to four months, uh, up, well, until uh, we eventually formed our uh, founders agreement uh, when we uh, decided and agreed on uh, um, on the skills and assignments uh, for each uh, each of us 
and it was very time consuming and took a lot of uh, uh, nerves and energy instead of focusing on the product. Uh, effective communication uh, and leadership in team management uh, is uh, probably one of the biggest uh, issues for uh, early stage uh, startups. Uh, I believe you have heard uh, what is the number one reason uh, startups fail. Uh, it's uh, founders issues. Because uh, in many cases, uh, uh, also in our case, uh, even if your product uh, doesn't really uh, work or even if your uh, service uh, uh, is not valid uh, at this stage or in this form, you can always pivot. Uh, but uh, when there are problems uh, among the founders or uh, in uh, the vertical with uh, first employees, then in most cases, uh, if those problems are not solved immediately in a hard way, uh, then uh, those teams uh, usually fail. And uh, we have seen a lot of uh, examples of failed teams, uh, even with the brilliant product, with the brilliant service, uh, because of the founder's issues. Uh, now, uh, as I already uh, mentioned, the task uh, allocation uh, there are several uh, strategies uh, how to do that. Again, I uh, my goal is uh, not to translate to you uh, stuff from Google, uh, but uh, uh, before identifying uh, assignments to each and every person, we definitely need to understand uh, their individual uh, strength. There are tons of uh, wonderful tests and uh, uh, great uh, books on this subject. Uh, yes, we will talk about the agreement uh, a bit later, but uh, yeah, that's that's a very important issue. So uh, uh, it's important to understand uh, what you're really good at, because uh, again, in our company, uh, in our first company, uh, there were several issues where uh, people were trying to lead uh, the roles they uh, definitely well couldn't perform it like uh, our uh, lead engineer uh, who was a very bright engineer one of the best i know uh, he tried to uh, become the product owner uh, those are two absolutely different uh, roles because uh, the product owner's uh, responsibilities is not the product itself it's actually communication uh, it's uh, protecting the team, uh, the development team, and uh, uh, building up the framework uh, for development, communicating with uh, end users. And usually developers are not good at that. So it's an absolutely different framework and a different type of personality uh, it usually takes to, uh, to be a product owner. Uh, and then... Uh, um, how do we uh, monitor uh, the progress uh, in the team? I think one of the biggest mistakes uh, I have made uh, in our first team, uh, we didn't uh, really validate uh, the KPIs, uh, short-term KPIs, uh, but also uh, the OKRs uh, for the team at, uh, at the early stage. Uh, we uh, believe that, that we can go with the flow and uh, see how it goes. Uh, today, um, talking with uh, every one of my portfolio company uh, founders, uh, I always insist on uh, identifying uh, at least one KPI that uh, we're going to measure in the next uh, two to three months. So what is it that we are focusing on right now? Is it uh, the product? Is it the number of uh, interviews we are performing? Uh, is it the number of uh, users uh, that are coming on board uh, every uh, week or every month? So we need uh, to measure something and uh, this something uh, uh, can't be bullshit. It should be 
something very valid that uh, we can affect because it doesn't make sense to uh, measure anything that we, we cannot affect uh, through our action. And at uh, the very early stage, uh, I would say that uh, one of the most important things to measure and actually analyze is the feedback from potential users. Because uh, before we start coding, before we start actually building the product, first of all, we need to understand uh, uh, what market uh, expectations are towards uh, uh, this service, this product, or towards our team. Uh, in many cases, uh, we have seen that uh, brilliant teams uh, have been uh, spending uh, uh, months and months and uh, uh, tens of thousands of euros of investors' money, uh, first building and uh, then measuring. It usually fails. In most cases, it fails. And uh, uh, same with us uh, in our uh, first team uh, in our first startup we were building uh, the MVP for almost three months uh, without getting uh, a feedback from the market uh, we spent uh, um, very valuable time and a lot of uh, early stage money which is the most expensive money on building something uh, market didn't need and it took us another month or so to pivot uh, uh, from this uh, situation to the next market so uh, to, to the next product so we had to uh, raise the next round again and uh, because of that we lost uh, almost uh, seven percent of uh, the company to investors who actually didn't uh, uh, support our growth uh, so uh, monitoring progress and understanding your KPIs uh, will be one of the most crucial uh, assignments uh, to to the team and especially to CEO. That's uh, CEO's responsibility. Uh, then we have the individual uh, contribution metrics. And uh, again, this is something uh, that we will also touch when uh, talking about the founders agreement. Uh, but uh, uh, especially in uh, very early stage companies where people are not getting paid yet and uh, working on their spare time or over the weekends, uh, we can see the uh, communication inside the team. Uh, probably some of you have experienced that already, where you start blaming others. Uh, for not doing enough or uh, yeah 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 uh, and uh, how can we avoid that uh, through uh, very clear individual contribution metrics uh, for example uh, one of the teams uh, uh, I'm now following uh, they had uh, a problem with uh, the design and uh, uh, I found one of uh, the best uh, um, uh, designers in uh, in Estonia uh, to support the team. She committed uh, two hours uh, a week. So when the rest of the team uh, was actually working uh, uh, in their spare time, uh, 20 to 30 hours a week, uh, she was committing two hours a week. But... Uh, since we're dealing with the uh, top-level professional, then uh, uh, those hours uh, she committed were uh, extremely valuable. And uh, since this uh, uh, design side was crucial uh, for the product, uh, then uh, this commitment and uh, 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 this uh, development, uh, they basically made the product. Uh, so... Uh, in, in Inside the team, uh, we first had uh, miscommunication uh, between uh, founders and uh, early employees uh, who didn't understand what was the reason behind uh, uh, such a high stake in the company for this designer. Uh, she was uh, working for Sweat Equity. But uh, after uh, she delivered... Uh, 
uh, first versions of the product. Uh, uh, we explained it uh, to the team and uh, uh, everyone well, obviously understood uh, the value she has created in a shortest period of time. So it's all about the uh, communication uh, and uh, uh, building an open communication uh, is again one of the first uh, tasks for for the founding team. Uh, whether you're using uh, uh, Slack or uh, any other tool. Uh, I personally uh, like the motto that uh, uh, the wise team is using. No drama, uh, good karma. Uh, this was uh, also one of the first uh, agreements in our team. Uh, that uh, uh, we agreed with the founders uh, that whatever happens, uh, whatever uh, negative impressions or feeling uh, we do have, then uh, we agreed that every month we're going to have uh, one-on-ones uh, with the team, with every team member. And uh, we had a special calendar where everyone could book uh, one hour of uh, uh, a colleague's time and uh, those one-on-ones uh, which usually took place uh, during a long walk uh, they were very healthy and uh, kept uh, all the drama uh, away uh, from the office and uh, from the team chat uh, another thing we agreed on from day one that uh, there will be no personal blaming whatsoever so it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we avoided uh, uh, feedback and an open feedback uh, but uh, we agreed that uh, uh, it will never be uh, personalized so the feedback ex is extremely important uh, but uh, no blaming uh, because uh, again uh, coming back to the early stage um, it's clear that majority of uh, the team members are acting uh, uh, their best and uh, they are doing that uh, free of charge, basically, uh, without seeing any results. Uh, we do understand that majority of the people in the startup scene, in the early stage uh, companies, um, they are not coming from business. Most of those people are coming uh, uh, from employee mentality. And uh, from this perspective, it will definitely take time to build up um, business owner mentality or the ownership mentality. So we need to give them this time and uh, uh, we need to educate uh, our teams. Uh, for uh, this purpose, uh, one of uh, the very successful practices we implemented in the team was uh, called uh, Shipitwise uh, um, Library and Shipitwise Seminars. Uh, what we did, we organized uh, events like once a month, inviting uh, uh, some experienced uh, professionals from different teams, like from WISE or from Pipedrive, giving lectures or sharing their experience on some particular subject. Our team was there and we invited fellow startupers to participate at uh, those events. And uh, through uh, this kind of um, seminars and uh, meetups, uh, we built the mindset and uh, knowledge base of uh, our team uh, while at the same time sharing it with uh, fellow startupers. Uh, it helped a lot. Uh, plus uh, we had our library which uh, meant that uh, if uh, some of our team members uh, found uh, a useful well, book or article or uh, maybe some podcast uh, they didn't just uh, share it with the team they conspected it and uh, 
gave a short overview uh, and uh, the key points of uh, this book or article and then share the, the link or the content uh, with the team. So everyone uh, who felt that it's important for them, they could pick it up from there. Like one of the books I definitely recommend to every founder is uh, Traction. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't see it. Maybe you can show again. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Traction. Mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel uh, Weinberg and uh, Justin uh, Mars are the authors of this amazing book. And uh, another great book and a great author is uh, Eric uh, Ries, uh, The Startup Way. Absolutely amazing and uh, important uh, book for every founder. And the third book uh, I definitely recommend uh, to every founder is uh, a book by Ben Horowitz. Uh, what you do uh, is uh, who you are. Basically, in those uh, three books, you will find most of the uh, questions for your uh, we are answers for your hardest questions. Uh, now, uh, how do we uh, map uh, uh, competences? Again, there are different uh, frameworks uh, for that. Uh, we won't go into HR uh, too deeply uh, today. Uh, but uh, uh, one thing uh, which is extremely important to understand, especially for the early stage startup, uh, guys, we are investing uh, the most valuable uh, resource we have. It's our time. It means that uh, uh, what we want to achieve with our work uh, is uh, uh, bringing uh, a new service, a product uh, to the market uh, fast and uh, getting the feedback fast, not uh, to play with the idea for the next uh, year or two. Uh, because it's very time consuming and, uh, uh, well, from my perspective, uh, every startup is an experiment and our goal is to, uh, go through this experiment, uh, in the most efficient way, as fast as possible to be able to go, uh, to move fast. We need, uh, uh, to surround ourselves with, uh, top-notch uh, professionals from those particular fields uh, that can support us. Which means that uh, the founding team and uh, the early employees uh, uh, should be picked, uh, well, very seriously. Uh, those are the most important uh, people for your success. Uh, when... Uh, we start uh, building the rest of the team, we can uh, really look into, how do we call them, B players. Uh, but at the founding team, I definitely recommend to find the best of the best uh, you can uh, identify to fill the gap. Even uh, if those people are ready to commit uh, only a few hours a week or even a few hours a month, uh, you can still move much faster on their competence. Uh -huh. The second book, uh, Eric Ries, uh, The Startup Way. Uh, I personally know um, quite many co-founders Yeah. Uh, who are uh, working with uh, three to five different teams and they still uh, are very effective and uh, do it uh, efficiently. So uh, if I would uh, start a new company today, I would rather prefer a few hours of uh, top-notch professional 
uh, who can uh, uh, most probably have uh, a necessary experience and can introduce me uh, to the people in the industry uh, than uh, full time uh, of uh, someone who doesn't have an experience to move fast and to break things. Uh, again, uh, now we're talking about the very early stage of, uh, of any company. And uh, this is why uh, when I see uh, in the panel, a team with uh, somebody from uh, from the industry uh, that problem they are solving, and then there are a couple of uh, other people uh, that just joined on the way because they liked the idea. Uh, I always. Uh, prefer to run uh, several tests before actually putting my time into this team. And uh, uh, I want to understand the team dynamics and uh, the quality of the network of those people. Actually, this is why it's extremely important uh, uh, to get your LinkedIn uh, right because uh, it's pretty strange, but uh, still in several uh, industries, in old industries, you will find tons of people who never paid attention uh, to their professional uh, networking. And uh, due to that, uh, uh, they might just not be accepted as, uh, um, well, potential founders by, by investors or by uh, by potential hirers. So this was another uh, uh, experience for us uh, before entering the Startup Wise Guys Acceleration Program. Uh, we spent uh, several days on our LinkedIn profiles, getting them uh, intact with, uh, with the industry. And uh, since then, uh, I spend every week uh, hours on uh, building my uh, network there. And when I'm uh, talking about the building network, uh, it means that uh, I focus on adding value uh, to uh, the people in the industry uh, I'm working in, in order to get connected with them uh, and uh, get uh, endorsement uh, and uh, get accepted by the industry uh, leaders. Because uh, this is basically the only way or the easiest way to uh, get introduced uh, both to your uh, future uh, customers, to your future investors, etc. Uh, when we are looking, uh, yeah, when we are talking about the um, very early stage companies where uh, co-founders uh, have their corporate jobs, it might be uh, an issue for them to um, introduce uh, their new hobby uh, in their LinkedIn page. It's always uh, a compromise, but uh, what you definitely can do, you can uh, uh, build up your uh, projects or your company's uh, LinkedIn profile and uh, start building uh, content uh, under that uh, uh, and engage with, uh, with potential leads and uh, investors to start following uh, uh, the company's profile. Um, mm -hmm. uh, reaching talented people except LinkedIn and professional conferences. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's uh, definitely diff different meetups. Uh, basically everywhere. Uh, starting from Estonia, uh, every second week or so, uh, you will find uh, tons of uh, very interesting uh, events uh, for particular industries. Uh, I'm engaging uh, those kinds of uh, events at least uh, twice a month, 
uh, sometimes more if uh, if I'm focusing on uh, finding uh, some certain talent. But then again, uh, I spend uh, some time with uh, recruiters, uh, just uh, well, hanging, having uh, coffee, and uh, communicating. It doesn't mean uh, I always buy their services, uh, but uh, uh, it's networking. And uh, again, I do understand that if you are an engineer type of person, then uh, most probably professional networking uh, is a hell for introvert. Uh, um, it means you need to uh, find uh, or hire your strength uh, as a hustler, uh, add it to the team, or uh, just uh, change your perspective towards networking. It's an investment, and uh, uh, again, there are several great books on uh, uh, building those competences. Like one of those books is, uh, for instance, uh, "Never Eat Alone." Maybe I've heard about it. Uh, I won't tell you the author right away, but uh, yeah, it's an extremely uh, good handbook. Uh, and uh, then again, uh, aligning competences with uh, strategic goals. Uh, we were uh, first building uh, a supply chain uh, company, a supply chain service. It meant that uh, uh, a person from the supply chain uh, as a, a key competence was extremely important. But after the second pivot, uh, when uh, we changed our product uh, towards the uh, tools uh, for uh, shipping companies, uh, basically we lost the need uh, for this particular uh, competence. And, uh, well, what happened? The person uh, left the team because, uh, well, she felt and understood that uh, she cannot add more value uh, with this particular uh, vertical, so to say. And uh, uh, those uh, decisions to let people go, they are the hardest decisions you can well, make as a CEO. But then again, uh, as you operate with limited resources, uh, you have to do them. Uh, now let's jump uh, into the equity and uh, a cap table. Uh, again, uh, when we launched our company, my absolutely biggest mistake was that uh, we had uh, too many founders in the beginning. Uh, it wasn't three, it wasn't five, it was seven. <laughs> I have six co-founders uh, on day one. And... Uh, uh, the fullest thing uh, or the fullest idea I could come up with uh, was uh, to share the equity between all seven of us. It felt right, but it's actually a dumb idea because first of all, uh, investors will never accept that. And uh, second, you as a founder or maybe you have uh, a second co-founder. Uh, it's it's your baby, and uh, you are the parents who will grow this baby. You are committed, like all in. Uh, most of other people in the team, they will never have the same level of commitment. We need to understand that, and we need to understand that uh, the difference in cap table uh, between uh, you as a main founder or the one of a uh, few co-founders will be huge. Like uh, in one of my teams uh, where uh, we had uh, a similar problem a few weeks ago where the founding team uh, consists of a uh, CEO who is uh, uh, basically the 
soul bound uh, founder of uh, of the project uh going through two major pivots uh, and uh, being responsible for everything uh, he wanted to uh, bring on board uh, a CTO and giving uh, him uh, about a quarter of the company. Uh, after consulting with uh, uh, investment fund, uh, we agreed that uh, although the CTO role is uh, important, uh, he will get 7%. Uh, and uh, there are several reasons uh, behind that. Uh, one of the reasons, for example, is that uh, the CTO uh, needs to be paid as soon as possible because uh, he has no other sources of income. He lives uh, in Asia. And uh, he has to choose between uh, equity and uh, payroll. <laughs> So if you are looking for uh, a payroll of roughly, well, 2,000 euros a month uh, because you have high expenses, then you definitely cannot uh, expect uh, the high equity stake in the company at the early stage. That's only fair because the main founder uh, doesn't uh, take any cash uh, out of the early stage investment and is bootstrapping for over two years now. Uh, and the first uh, employee who came on board as a, a sales director, uh, her equity was uh, evaluated and calculated uh, as 1.5% uh, of the cap table, for example while the outsourced uh, development house uh, after launching the MVP, a sellable MVP, uh, has uh, already converted 6.5% uh, of the company. The goal of uh, uh, every founder and uh, basically of every investment uh, fund and uh, the angels is uh, keeping uh, key people in the company engaged and uh, interested in the future growth. The only way to do that is uh, uh, to keep the control in the hands of uh, the main founder or founders. So we always uh, prefer that uh, the main founder uh, keeps at least 51% of uh, shares. And uh, this is one uh, example that you might want to uh, look in, where you can see that uh, the founder's stake uh, at the seed stage should be at least uh, 65%. Uh, investors uh, by that time might already have uh, 20 plus percent and uh, 12 percent is allocated to employees and future employees as a pool. And then as we go on with the investment rounds, uh, situation uh, is changing, of course, but uh, at the same time, the valuation of the company is uh, growing. So... Uh, at the B round, uh, founder keeping 35% uh, of uh, the stake of the company uh, still has uh, uh, quite a nice uh, piece of equity. Uh, any questions on that side? I have one. Yes, please. Um, so when, when, for example, when you start a company with a co-founder and then you divide the company like 49, 51, like, how do you then decide later on, like, where to take the money? Like who, like, 
equally from both sides or how does it how does it work like in, in order to give uh, money to investors or allocate it to, uh, allocate to employees uh well uh if you have already made uh, this uh let's call it mistake okay <laughs> Yeah, if you have already made this mistake and you founded the company 5149, then uh, most probably before uh, the first investor comes on board, uh, they will force you to uh, change the cap table and uh, to rewrite uh, the founder's agreement. Uh, it might uh, uh, bring the problem. Most probably it will bring up the problem if... Uh, uh, both uh, co-founders are first-time founders. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, extremely important to understand that uh, if we're talking about venture game, the rules are different. Uh, the stake of the company is not as important as the valuation. Mm -hmm. You can uh, keep 5% uh, of the company, but if uh, the valuation is, uh, well, 1 billion, uh, well, you are still good. So uh, never, never uh, try to negotiate percentage. Uh, try to do your best uh, to get your valuation up. And uh, protect uh, your uh, main founder. Protect the guy uh, with the flag because uh, uh, he is under fire always, like uh, at every situation. He has the highest responsibility. The person who is uh, uh, in charge of uh, uh, bringing on the investments, in charge of uh, hiring uh, uh, new talents, uh, in charge of uh, pitching uh, the company, selling the product, uh, he or she needs to be protected uh, by the uh, control package. Because uh, one day, uh, the situation will uh, arise where some investor or some fund uh, will become, might become unfriendly. And uh, in order uh, not to give uh, away the company or uh, basically to to let uh, the hostel takeover happen uh, you need to control the the stake does that happen often yes more often than you think mm. this uh, is ruthless. yeah <laughs> business is ruthless uh no, no, it's it's always about uh, uh, it's always about performance, and uh, investors' expectations are so much different. This is why it's extremely important uh, to um, marry your investments or date your investments before you marry them, and uh, to understand their values, to understand their long-term game and uh, expectations. But in the end, it's a venture game. They have responsibility uh, in front of their LPs and their goal is uh, to return the money. So if you want to enter uh, the venture game, uh, those are the rules. However, you don't need to play this game. Uh, you can uh, grow organically. And uh, there are several great examples of uh, the companies in uh, Estonia, in Europe, globally, uh, that uh, basically never engaged uh, a single investor and uh, they are still uh, close to unicorns. Um, a question on that, on this organic growth, how, and it's quite a general question, but what do you think would be required or in order to be able to do that? Is it kind of just getting lots of customers as early as you can, um, being really lean, really looking at kind of revenue, and cost models or yeah what would be your advice if someone wanted to kind of really try that route versus getting investment yes uh, excellent question and uh, uh, i have only one answer uh, know your numbers get the numbers right uh, there are only 
three major uh, figures you need to understand precisely and you need to know them by heart it's your uh, customer acquisition cost it's your customer lifetime value and your churn when you know those three you are on the safe side of course you need the kick-ass products <laughs> that that users love and uh, if you can uh, integrate uh, uh, the viral product, uh, the viral uh, strategies, marketing strategies in, into a product. Well, uh, this is the solution. This is one of the solutions. Like uh, we have uh, uh, one excellent, uh, yeah, uh, we have one excellent uh, company in uh, Estonia. Uh, it is called uh, MRP Easy, MRP Easy. And uh, they have been growing organically since uh, uh, seven or eight years, I think, uh, working on every continent, uh, selling their SaaS uh, software for manufacturing companies. Uh, basically, growing on the revenue share uh, with their users. Excellent strategy. Uh, so uh, the three numbers you need to understand is your CAC, customer acquisition cost, is uh, your LTV, uh, customer's lifetime value. Uh, I will elabor elaborate on uh, all of them right now. And uh, churn. So uh, what is uh, customer acquisition cost? Uh, exactly as it sounds, uh, how much will it actually take to bring on the new customer? Uh, we uh, might make this mistake that we will only um, calculate the uh, amount of euros uh, we spent on Google or uh, Facebook uh, uh, to land a number of customers uh, to our website. However, that's not uh, everything because uh, we also need to take in uh, consideration uh, uh, all the other costs that uh, uh, we do have in the company uh, and uh, divide them by the number of uh, active uh, users right now. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, it might happen that uh, the uh, marketing will be profitable, but uh, operations uh, will actually kill the business. I had uh, uh, a similar situation with my first product. Uh, the revenue was going up. Uh, the number of users was going up, uh, but uh, the operation costs eventually ruined everything. Like uh, we started scaling uh, too early our uh, operations were not optimized uh, or uh, automated. Uh, it meant that uh, like 10 to 15% of our operations uh, were made manually. And uh, this manual work uh, was uh, expensive enough to kill all the profit. And since we didn't have uh, any strategy uh, for losing uh, uh, those uh, uh, negative uh, leads, uh, we decided to kill the product, although the product itself was profitable. This is why we need to understand the numbers uh, very precisely and uh, not to focus just on uh, uh, particular cost of uh, onboarding uh, the new customer or the new user. There are much more. Uh, customer lifetime value uh, means exactly uh, how it sounds, how long the customer uh, will stay uh, with us. Well, let's take an example. Uh, for instance, uh, I am paying for Google Drive and uh, I'm also paying for Apple Cloud. But uh, I started paying for them uh, about a year ago. I have been using them, though, uh, for over a decade. It means that uh, uh, they were targeting me as an existing user, trying to upsell me. 
every time they are trying to upsell me, it costs them money. Now, let's say that uh, onboarding me would cost them, finally, if they calculated all the costs that they spend on communicating with me, uh, 150 euros. I'm paying them 2.99. How long should I stay with them to cover their costs? And what should they do to make themselves sticky to spend more money on me to keep me going? Or maybe upsell me with the next uh, stage of their product. Those are the numbers we need to understand when we are planning the uh, pricing strategy. And most of the products, uh, most of the services uh, I know at the early stage are doing that uh, poorly. Uh, I think it was um, Mark Andreessen who was asked once by Tim Ferriss at his interview that if you would have a billboard on the road to San Francisco and you could give only one suggestion to founders on this billboard, what would it be? Andreessen uh, thought for a second and said that uh, I would write the race prices. Because in uh, many cases, we are so keen uh, to get uh, the customer to give the best terms, whatever, uh, that uh, we are getting our X or sheet wrong. And uh, basically, we are killing our company by giving out uh, uh, the product or service that we need to maintain. without having uh, a second product to upsell. So uh, the right pricing is uh, definitely one of the most important decisions uh, uh, you would have to make uh, at a certain point. Well, now uh, let's jump uh, uh, quickly into Founders Agreement. For, for a sec, <laughs> can yes, you uh, clarify the cap table, please, again? Because uh, you were talking about holding uh, the equity in the company for the founder, for the main founder. And uh, we can see, looking at the table, that uh, at the stage A, it's already 45%. So it's less than 51. That means, well, that's the company... Uh, is already not in the hands of the main founder. So uh, what's the point of holding uh, this percent for him or for her if uh, at the A early stage, actually, well, the stage E is a pretty early stage of the company, if it's already in the investor's stake? Uh, if you uh, will look into Crunchbase or angel.co, uh, then you will realize that uh, there are not so many companies uh, who ever raised uh, more than uh, a round. There are actually very few companies uh, going through B and C rounds and uh, maybe only uh, a single digit of companies uh, in each country that uh, uh, went all the way through uh, the rounds. Uh, but uh, by even already by the A round, uh, you, in most cases, have either a strategic investor on board who um, is your industry insider and uh, helping you uh, not just uh, to finance your operations, but uh, actually to sell your product. Uh, which means that at this stage, in many cases, you are already on the same side. And uh, another thing is that uh, by this stage, even by the Series A round, you have more than one fund on board. Uh, if you are uh, doing your job as a founder, and if you are uh, identifying the right uh, funds, the right uh, investors, and uh, build relationship with those investors, then... Uh, uh, the chances are that uh, some of them 
are your friends or at least they support you at this particular uh, stage in this particular market situation plus your employees at uh, the uh, series a stage are still highly motivated and if you can influence uh, them uh, at the voting shares uh, then most probably you still have uh, more people on your side than against you if there is someone against you uh, but uh, at series b uh, the valuation of the company is already uh, high enough so you have uh, a board of directors and you have quite a strong corporate uh, structure uh, in your team uh, and at this uh, stage uh, even at stage b most probably in many cases uh, the initial founders uh, might not even be active at the company uh, they might be either semi-retired or working on uh, different projects or working on growth and uh, you have hired uh, someone to uh, manage the company mm -hmm. so uh, can i ask another one Yes, of course. Or maybe the end of the sure, presentation. Sure. Uh, well, uh, you were talking about the investors who have some, well, negative thoughts uh, and uh, planning not very good things uh, uh, within the company. How maybe there is a strategy to identify such people or such such investors? Some tips to, well, uh, bring and board the, the right person, if I should say. Yeah. Uh... Again, uh, when you are looking for investment, you are dating. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you are dating uh, in traditional way, you most probably do not ask from uh, their exes uh, about their behavior. But uh, in the investment field, it's pretty easy to contact uh, the founders uh, from the portfolio of uh, uh, this particular fund and uh, get a feedback from uh, from founders. Because uh, if uh, some people in the fund are assholes, then uh, they have been assholes uh, before you. Uh, so it's not that... Uh, you need them you should understand that they need you as well because uh, they are not operating with their own money it's a fund money and they are fund managers their goal is to identify the right service right product put money in take money out so they are managing this fund it's not their money. Uh, and uh, they are playing this game, the same game, from the other side of the table. So uh, it means that uh, you need each other at the same level, basically. So if they are doing due diligence on you, it's definitely your job to do due diligence on them. Yeah, it's like chess. Yes, <laughs> Katri is right. It is. Any more questions on that? Yes, please. Um, if by that you mean the cap table. Mm -hmm. Um. So my question is the following. Um. Since you know we're in early stage and idea stage, and I'm looking to um get some co-founders. I do not know if we would ever need additional capital. So we might end up bootstrapping. But then when I approach people to be my co-founders, how do I know how much of an equity do I offer them? Do I offer it in exchange for um, you know money? How, how do I even handle that? I'm sorry if it's a very beginner level question. but No, 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 no. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important question. Uh, it's an extremely important question. And uh, in this particular situation, you need to have the backbone uh, to 
it depends on how much you believe in uh, in your product and uh, basically you are the number one evangelist of this product or the service and uh, if you remember uh, this amazing book uh, uh, Tom Sawyer uh, do you remember how uh, Tom didn't want to paint the fence and uh, promoted to his friends uh, who painted it for him uh, while at the same time uh, sharing their belongings with him so this is your job mm -hmm. your job is not to give away uh, equity uh, your job is uh, to get people excited and get them on board to build with you because it's fun, because it's cool, because it's the next big thing. If you fail uh, with this job and uh, instead of that uh, share the equity, it means that you don't believe in your product uh, enough. Okay, thank you. Equity is a long time commitment. And it only makes sense. Anyway, you can you can give away like, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% of your company uh, with uh, uh, three years vesting time. And I can assure you that most of the people who will start the journey with you will not be vested. Or at least they won't be fully vested. If you have the three years uh, vesting period for for the option shares in the company uh, and the vesting starts uh, after one year <laughs> maybe i don't know 20 30 percent of uh, of your early partners and team members will actually vest their first one third in reality people quit people quit on everything people quit on uh, marriages people quit on business people quit on sports so why do you think they will stick with you till the end so don't worry about that too much okay thank you and uh, when we are talking about the founders agreement uh this is definitely one of the most important decisions you have to make because, uh, uh, as you know, the best contracts are the ones that uh, will never get implemented. This is your protection, protection uh, against yourself and uh, protection against wrong decisions, where uh, in this agreement we'll describe every angle of, uh, of your business and of the assignments and roles and uh, responsibilities of your co-founders. And uh, one day it might happen that uh, it will save the company. Like in our situation, we had uh, eventually three uh, co-founders in the team where one of them uh, left at uh, the most hard moment. He did it uh, in a way <laughs> I most probably would never do. And uh, this this was the first. Yeah. Are you having a May, I have a. So uh, this was the very first time where we uh, opened the safe and uh, took out the founder's agreement. And according to this agreement, he was a bad lever and uh, he had to leave the company without any shares. And due to that, only due to that, we eventually were able to sell the company to the third party. because we got our shares back. Uh, there are uh, very professional 
uh, documents available, for instance, at uh, Startup Estonia website. Uh, you can free of charge uh, find uh, uh, all the necessary documents. Let me find it for you. Uh, all the necessary model documents uh, that you will ever need at the company. Here they are. Mm. Ah, where is the chat? Could someone please initiate the chat so I can copy it there? <laughs> I don't see it with the share screen. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Uh, so under that link, you will uh, find all the necessary documents if you don't have them yet. And uh, I would uh, strongly recommend you uh, to take it seriously, to fill the gaps and uh, to sign the agreement uh, before, at least before uh, you will... Uh, join any acceleration program or take your first investment on board. Yeah, you're welcome. And you don't need to pay lawyers uh, thousands and thousands. You can easily use those models and... Uh, uh, they are valid. Uh, most of Estonian startups, even uh, a later stage, are using the same models. Uh, so, as I uh, told you, uh, all those subjects, uh, they are extremely deep. Um, you can find uh, several great books, podcasts, and uh, videos on each of those subject and uh, dive uh, very deep. Uh, if I would leave you with uh, two, well, major assignments today, I would say that, uh, first of all, keep your numbers right and uh, know your numbers by heart and get your paperwork right. Because when you start filling those gaps, you will start actually thinking and analyzing the agreements and uh, commitment of each and uh, every one of your team. And uh, this most probably will give you much deeper insights on uh, the amount of uh, shares or percentage of uh, the company you are willing to uh, share with uh, other people. Uh, consider it as your baby. So who you're going to raise it with? I think it's extremely important question. Any question? Um, I have another question to you. Um, one of the very first things you said about how a team should be about um, consisting of a hustler, a hipster and a hacker. What are your thoughts on the no code idea that kind of rather than, especially in the early stages, taking a hacker on, on board, trying to wing it with no code and then later on when the product's a bit more developed and you have a clear idea of where you're going revisiting the idea of getting a hacker by that i mean like an actual software developer <laughs> yeah yeah uh i totally agree that uh, no code solutions uh, uh today um are making uh, founders life easier at the same time um again we uh, need to understand that uh, in most cases, no code is only good for MVPs. But uh, as soon as we dive deeper, 
and uh, are building really strong, uh, well, uh, complicated uh, products, it's very hard to avoid uh, coding. Uh, so in this case, if uh, finding a coder is a problem, uh, then you might want to look into an option of uh, sweat equity with uh, with some teams. And today it's a well, unfortunately, a great time to find those teams because uh, the market is down and uh, uh, those teams are looking for new challenges, new opportunities, and uh, if you will be able to sell them the vision, uh, it's pretty easy today to uh, to back yourself with a development team. That was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Could you um, please? Can I ask? Uh, my question uh, is about finding a co-founder. I found that uh, Y Combinator, uh, well, the very, very famous one, uh, offers uh, a solution, so a match with co-founders, but it goes well in the US and um, maybe, you know, some matching co-founders co uh, combinator, or, well, a website in Europe. Uh, because, well, of course, it's better to communicate when you're maybe at least in, in European Union, you don't have to travel to US to talk to your co-founder in person. Uh, yeah, what uh, Y Combinator does is uh, exceptional. Uh, I know uh, their platform. Uh, honestly, I haven't seen uh, anything close uh, in Europe so far at least anything working. Uh, our problem in Europe, uh, unfortunately, is uh, a multiculture. <laughs> we are too fragmented as, uh, as a region. Uh, thus, uh, uh, although there are tons of uh, great talents uh, here and there, uh, the language issues and uh, cultural uh, issues uh, are the ones that are uh, keeping us uh, from uh, building this kind of tools. Uh, so I would strongly recommend you to look into, uh, for instance, LinkedIn communities. But then again, depending on uh, uh, the vertical you are uh, working in, uh, it's still uh, events and uh, um, and uh, groups of founders or telegram chats uh, uh, by verticals or yeah it's a problem but uh, I haven't seen almost anyone who a uh, founder who hasn't solved this problem <laughs> I hope so well, our team is missing a hipster so <laughs> to find one yeah uh, about the development team uh, yeah I do man, mean uh, sweat equity uh, and uh, if you dive into for instance let me see Actually, on, on LinkedIn, I'm getting uh, every now and then, uh, mo mostly once or twice a week, I'm getting uh, communication from uh, different development teams. Uh, they are mostly from uh, Ukraine nowadays, but also from Poland, uh, sometimes from Belarus. And... Uh, yeah, if you go uh, to Facebook groups, uh, there are tons of groups of developers. Just put uh, developers uh, uh, into the uh, search window and uh, jump into those groups. Uh, you will most definitely find uh, someone who will bring you to someone. 
uh, I would say that uh, today there are more uh, development teams looking for projects than uh, vice versa. That's great, thank you. <laughs> May I have a question about, again, the co-founders team? Yes, please. So if you're um, by design trying to launch a product that's international um, and the co-founders you're considering are based, let's say I'm in Europe, somebody's in the US and somebody else is in India, and those are probably some of the biggest markets that your product would target, how much of a issue would be that you're not in the same place how much would of an issue would be if you end up going into an accelerator program and so on it's usually not an issue uh like for instance tenity accelerator just launched their new program uh, a week ago uh we went there with one of my teams and uh as i mentioned the cto is based uh, in uh, Vietnam, while uh, part of the development team is based on Belarus, and there were no issues. Thank you. It's rather a culture and the vibe, because uh, uh, we see it a lot uh, in gaming. Uh, majority of the gaming teams uh, operate uh, in a way that uh, uh, founders never met each other. And uh, in Web3, uh, we are building uh, products uh, uh, talking with uh, avatars, actually. Uh, in some cases, uh, we don't even know the real names of uh, of people because when uh, uh, crypto is involved, in, it doesn't matter. So... It's rather, it's rather the culture and uh, the goal and uh, the vision of uh, what you want to achieve. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have one question. Is it convenient to ask about uh, MVP and investments? Uh, well, it's not very connected to team questions. Sure, sure, sure. absolutely. So my question is, uh, or should I raise funds and ask for investments before uh, creating MVP uh, ready to sell? Well, at least uh, well, some kind of version of it. Or I should build an MVP first and then uh, raise funds? Uh, well, uh, it's a wide question because it depends really on the... Uh, product and the vertical you are uh, working in. Uh, for instance, if you are building uh, a next blockchain for something, uh, then it's impossible that you're going to build an MVP with your own funding. It's very expensive. So if you have a white paper, uh, a very clear understanding what you do and uh, how you're going to do it, and uh, if you have engaged with uh, the right talents who are able to build it, uh, it might be already a good time to talk with uh, some funds. Because like maybe you need uh, like 20, 30 million uh, just to get the first version out. Uh, when we are talking about a cons consumer product or uh, some uh, simple platforms or tools, then in most cases, uh, Investors wants to see something. They want to see the customer engagement. It doesn't have to be uh, an automated product. It can be uh, just a working front end where you actually manually service them. Uh, but then uh, you need to have the customer engagement uh, growth uh, week over week or month over month. Uh, and a very clear strategy on uh, unit economics. If the unit economics is uh, clear for for me, then uh, I might uh, take a risk and uh, put some money in. 
Okay. We'll do our best. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a question. Firstly, thank you. It has been so valuable information and and insights and so much food for thought. My question is about, well, I've seen from hackathons that usually there are these three ages, hustlers, hackers, hipsters together. At first, when the idea is pitched and, and everything is good, there's so much motivation. And in the beginning, it's like Slack channels are created. Everything is created. It's there. And then, of course, it's bootstrapping in the beginning. And then the motivation starts to die. How to cope with that? How to keep this motivation alive? First, of course, if people are in one country. And the second one, if they are working like uh, from different parts of the world and it's only online. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we went through that. And uh, what I know for sure is uh, that uh, sales solve every problem as long as uh, you have uh, your customers or potential users engaged and the feedback uh, that is coming from the market is uh, positive towards your idea or uh, your mvp or your future product uh, this is definitely what uh, keeps the energy up in the team everything else is uh, uh, kind of bollocks <laughs> but uh, uh, another thing you as a founder you as a um, how to say uh, basically you are an entertainer in this case and uh, you are selling but first you are selling to your people uh, it's your responsibility. It's all on you. You're selling a vision of something that never been made before. And uh, it's part of the job of a founder of a CEO uh, to keep the energy up. But certainly there should be milestones to celebrate, whatever they are. Maybe it's a new website. Maybe it's a first... Uh, uh, customer maybe it's a uh, hundreds interview whatever but uh, we need to celebrate the small wins even if uh, those wins are not financial yet and uh, uh, of course uh, in the end all of us we do it for money let's be fair <laughs> so uh, first you need to understand where this money will come from and when you know it uh, sell it to your team hi hey. i also i also have a question and also very thankful thank you for the whole session it was very very informative and as you just said the as last word the money part uh what are the land what is the landscape for a CEO salary uh, currently, because for example, I, I also believe many of us, but me as well, I have a job right now and I need to know what is the risk where I am going. Uh, so how, how, what, what can you tell about uh, the salary expectations for CEOs? Of mm -hmm. course, I know a lot depends on the product and the service, but other than that, if you can share something. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as a founder, uh, I never work for money. I work for equity. And uh, founder's uh, salary is equity. This is my perspective. Of course, uh, I need to thank my car and uh, to charge my phone. And uh, it would be a good idea to uh, sleep in a warm but uh, that's more or less it uh, so uh, as soon as we see that uh, in some of our portfolio companies uh, uh, our founders have too high expectations uh, towards uh, uh, cash before uh, the product 
or cash before uh, the growth, uh, it's a red flag. That's why I would rather prefer people to work on the product uh, spare time, uh, have their life intact. Although, obviously, if you are building the future, you leave your comfort zone. Otherwise, uh, the job of CEO, uh, the job of founder, is the hardest job on the planet. It's like uh, being a mom, uh, but uh, like 10 times harder. Uh, because you're in pain uh, every day for different reasons not just for nine months, it could last like uh, several years. Uh, so if you're not prepared, don't start. But uh, why people are playing the venture game? Because uh, uh, this is the only game uh, where you can use leverage. Uh, we are building scalable products here. Uh, there are two types of leverage in the world. Other people time and other people money. And now there are third technology. Uh, if you nail it, you're made for life. This is why I would take this risk. That's the only reason. Uh, of course, if our goal is not to go back home on Mars. Like, I think Elon is from Mars. He just want to go home. We want but, to tell you, he, you, told, you said that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a different type of motivation. <laughs> How can we be sure that we are not from Mars, actually? <laughs> Oh, we can't. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> I was always told that I'm not from Mars, so I'm not sure <laughs> about me myself. Yeah, then uh, why don't you join the X? <laughs> Your chances will be higher. I'll come in my own, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So I think uh, let's finish now. If uh, someone have a very quick uh, question, then uh, can do it still. But has anyone some quick questions? Seems like nope. But very, very big uh, thank you for uh, Alexander to be here and sharing that with us. Uh, and yeah, that's it. So uh, I will uh, just uh, share with the teams that uh, International Coaching Day will be 29th of February in the morning. So now you know, and uh, the more information will come soon. So yeah, have a nice evening, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.